Welcome to the afternoon panel uh, with the very precise panel uh, title of protests. Uh, we have four speakers. Uh, could I please ask um, all four? <laughs> Excuse me. Hay fever already. Been um, to be uh, very strict um, and keep to the 10 minute presentation limit. Uh, we'll go in the order on the program. So our first speaker, Olena Nikolayenko, has a slightly different title. Uh, her new title is Gender and Family in a Presidential Race, the case of the 2020 election in Belarus. Olena is a professor of political science at Fordham University in New York City, New York State. Her research interests include comparative democratization, contentious politics, women's activism and youth. Oliana, would you like to start? Uh, thank you very much for your introduction and thank you for inviting me to be a, a part of this uh, uh, conference. Um, I will make um, every effort to be punctual and stay on time, but uh, of course, please feel free to uh, stop me if I go over time. Um, I think for this audience, I don't have to provide uh, um, a lot of background information about the 2020 presidential election in which Alexander Lukashenko ran for the sixth consecutive term in office. Uh, at the age of 66, uh, he was not ready to transfer uh, power to his successor or one of his sons, as is very common in many authoritarian regimes. Uh, Viktor uh, Lukashenko's oldest son was uh, the national security advisor to the president uh, for many years. Uh, his uh, middle son, uh, Dmitry, uh, positioned himself as a businessman. Uh, and uh, Kola, at the time of the election, was a high school student. Uh, and uh, he is widely seen as a person who is groomed to be, you know, the next uh, president. Uh, and uh, in 2020, uh, the incumbent uh, faced uh, one of um, the most, uh, you know, uh, powerful kind of threats to his uh, regime and to the uh, uh, to his uh, domination um, uh, in the elections uh, by. Um, allowing uh, the spouse of a jailed blogger and a mother of two to run for elections. Uh, so I thought that uh, to some extent, uh, uh, family uh, and uh, parenthood uh, uh, played a role in uh, this uh, election campaign. And I was interested in exploring how the two main presidential candidates uh, uh, dealt with the issue of uh, parenthood uh, and uh, the impact of gender on the discourse. Um, and uh, in recent years, in general, in political science literature, there is a growing interest uh, in uh, the role of motherhood and the politicization of motherhood in particular. Uh, traditionally, uh, motherhood is seen as um, often a liability in election battles uh, uh, in Western democracies. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, there are some cases uh, when motherhood was uh, transformed into an asset uh, for uh, political candidates. Uh, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, you know, the case of um, uh, Pauline, uh, uh, Sarah Pauline, who was uh, like a, Vice President nominee um, illustrates this point uh, as a mother of five. Uh, uh, you know, she tried to capitalize on her image uh, of mother and try to score some political points, uh, especially among uh, social conservatives uh, within the Republican Party. Uh, so there might be a situation when uh, motherhood can be an asset uh, rather than an liability. Uh, and uh, the, the main research questions that I tried to pose in the project are, are what is the impact of gender on the self-presentation of a candidate's family in campaign speeches, and uh, more specifically, how did Lukashenko and Tsikhanovskaya 
um, sorry, uh, how did they um, frame parenthood and how did they, you know, touch upon the issue of parenting in their campaign speeches? So I decided to focus just on a handful of um, campaign speeches uh, that um, reached the, the widest audience uh, possible. Uh, in according to the uh, laws, the election campaign laws in Belarus, uh, each presidential candidate was uh, given an opportunity to deliver two uh, speeches on national TV. And uh, uh, so Tsikhanovska, Svetlana Tsikhanovska delivered two speeches on July 21st and on July 28th. Uh, Lukashenko declined uh, to use uh, this uh, ad time, uh, declined, uh, you know, the idea that he would be introduced as a candidate, you know, rather than a, a, pre a president of the country. Uh, so uh, for the sake of comparison, I decided to use uh, uh, his address to the National Assembly uh, that was uh, delivered uh, uh, just a few days before the election, and that was also broadcast on, uh, you know, all the main um, TV channels uh, in um, uh, Belarus, and it can be seen also as like a, some form of campaigning. Uh, the uh, speeches delivered by Tikhanovskaya were uh, considerably shorter than Lukashenko's annual address. Uh, her first speech was only uh, like, uh, like 1,500 uh, words, uh, 1,515. Uh, the second one was a little longer, uh, 2,453. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, we can uh, look at the text and uh, try to understand to what extent uh, um, topics, uh, words related to parenthood or family uh, come up in their speeches. So, so you here on the slide, you can see uh, the most, uh, the, the words that, that were used in the speeches and the larger the font, uh, the more frequently these words were seen. So uh, the first thing that um, strikes, uh, I think anyone who looks at these images is that uh, they both, uh, uh, both speeches used frequently the words strana and chilavek. Strana is uh, the, the Russian for country, and chilavek uh, like person. Uh, by the way, both of the speeches were delivered uh, yeah, by, by Lukashenko and by Tikhanovsky, they were delivered in Russian, not in Belarusian. Um, so uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's understandable why she did it because she uh, brought up often uh, the, um, the YouTube channel uh, that was uh, produced by her spouse, Sergei uh, Tsikhanovsky, Strana Dla Zizny, and she kind of tried to build on um, his discourse and use uh, the same, to some extent, rhetoric uh, to appeal to the electorate and, in particular, uh, his supporters. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, Lukashenko, uh, who um, delivered his speech uh, a little bit later, uh, used uh, the same top words uh, in his speeches to Srana uh, uh, and, and Chilavek. So just, uh, uh, I apologize here, the font is uh, quite small, um, uh, but um, these are the top most frequently used words in all the three speeches. Uh, and I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, uh, in uh, Tsikhanovska's speeches, uh, she did uh, Discuss, uh, she did discuss uh, her family, uh, in particular um, uh, the role of her spouse in motivating her to run for presidency. Uh, she also spoke uh, about uh, um, her desire to take care of uh, uh, her children and also to provide a better future for all the children in Belarus. Um, 
although as we can see, there is a difference between her first campaign speech and her second campaign speech. In her second campaign speech, uh, the most frequently word that she used was the word blast uh, government. Uh, uh, and uh, um, and uh, you know, she was uh, targeting more uh, the incumbent and criticizing him for um, you know for maintaining a very politically uh, and economically stifling you know environment. Uh, um, and um, uh, just uh, let me just for the sake of time uh, briefly illustrate with a, a specific quotes uh, how the two candidates uh, approach the, the issue of family and uh, uh, how they try to draw parallels between the relations within the family, uh, between children and uh, uh, parents, uh, and uh, the relationship between uh, ordinary citizens uh, and the incumbent government. Uh, um, at Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya in her first and second campaign speech uh, emphasized the fact uh, that uh, she uh, did not uh, have um, uh, initially an ambition to run for presidency and uh, uh, her primary motivation was uh, to uh, continue the cause of her husband, uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky, and that's why he mentioned uh, him several times in her introductory comments, uh, introductory remarks, uh, and emphasized uh, that uh, he was the one who was uh, fighting for you know better future, better life in the country. Um, and uh, she involved, she tried to draw on the images of um, uh, the. Uh, caring mother who uh, is concerned about the well-being not just of her children but also uh, the well-being of uh, all the people in the country. Uh, and in her second uh, speech uh, she also drew on the idea uh, on um, to try to use some um, uh, kind of um, a comparison of an uh, uh, incumbent to a school teacher maybe in uh, and uh, uh, maybe I can just read uh, this uh, quote. I translated it here. You can see it in English, but I will read it uh, just uh, in Russian, in the original. Представьте себе, что у вашего ребенка в школе необразованный директор. Он не знает предметов, пишет с ошибками, приходит на работу пьяным, бьет школьника в линейкой по пальцам, при этом получает баснословные деньги, не слушает жалобы родителей, вызывает милицию каждый раз, когда вы заводите разговор о новом директоре. Uh, so that, so um, it's very typical, I think, of, of women to try and kind of focus on um, uh, policies that are more stereotypically associated with uh, like women, or that are more feminine, like healthcare, education, uh, welfare, uh, and uh, um, you know, she she try to. Uh, also, you know, draw upon these narratives uh, in her speeches uh, to uh, garner electoral support for her candidacy. Uh, and in contrast, uh, Lukashenko. Uh, one minute, he, Olena. Okay, uh, he tried to build on the model of a strict father, uh, and um, uh, he, mm, yeah, pointed out how uh, ill use in particular are behaving like um, ungrateful brats uh, who. Are, um, not uh, thankful to the incumbent government for everything that they provide for them. And he targeted specifically uh, Begu Lyseum, where his uh, son uh, was originally uh, supposed to go. Uh, so just to conclude uh, in a minute, uh, I wanted to uh, explore in this project uh, the impact of gender on the representation of family and uh, the use of references to, to parenthood and parenting to describe state society relations in contemporary Belarus. Uh, and I, to some extent, I think that both candidates reinforce the gender stereotypes that exist in society. Uh, Tsikhanovska tried to um, operate and campaign within the confines um, of a discourse uh, that uh, you know saw women as uh, like caretakers uh, uh, within the family, uh, and Lukashenko positioned himself, you know, as the father of the nation and uh, uh, propagated the idea of you know acting as like a strict father who enforces law and order uh, in society. Thank you. 
Thank you, Elena. Uh, I have questions, but I'll keep them till the end. Uh, very interesting. Um, our next speaker is Olya Sotnovskaya, um, who is an artist, organizer, and writer, currently a candidate for the PhD in practice program at the Academy of Fine Arts, Vienna. In her artistic and research practice, Olya addresses notions of festivity, collective choreography, movement, and the political within the post-socialist context and beyond. Her presentation is entitled The Poetics and Politics of Interruption in the 2020-21 uprising in Belarus. Oli. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining and for organizing this conference. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be here. So I will start. Uh, even though the 27 years of uh, Alexander Lukashenko's rule in Belarus was marked by regular protests, the scale and endurance of the 2020 post-elections uprising has been indeed exceptional. It has been particularly crucial as in Belarus, public space and the political field in general are normally repressed by the state. The masses of people not only resignified social relations and public space, what is more, amid the corruption of political institutes and legal systems, along with the state monopoly on media and public speech, bodily engagement seemed to be the major means of the struggle also directly affecting political imaginations. Thus, I believe that by focusing on the specific gestures and forms of collective movement, we can articulate the specificity of the ongoing political resistance. In particular, I will refer to the notions of interruption and exhaustion. On August 6, 2020, one of the most memorable and inspiring gestures of the anti-governmental resistance happened. The final and largest pre-election rally of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and the united team of the alternative candidates was scheduled in Minsk. But the authorities tried to block the event by organizing a last minute concert. Opposition supporters started to gather anyway when two sound engineers from Minsk State Palace of Children and Youth, Vladislav Sokolovsky and Kirill Galan, who had to work on the day, interrupted the official concert by playing the song Perimian changes and raising their arms in the protest gestures. This gesture of refusal has perhaps been particularly striking as it emerged from inside the system, out of the seemingly powerless position. Primian, a late Soviet post-punk song by the band Kino, never been explicitly political, already before this event has become a symbol of political transformation and consequently became one of the major protest anthems. Thinking about the gesture made by the DJs of Changes, how they were later called, I recall the writings of the colonial scholars Iftak and Kei Wei Yang, who theorized refusal in the context of academic research on indigenous and other marginalized communities as a strategy of empowerment. Though dealing with a different context and framework in this case, I believe that their reading of refusal could be guiding in understanding the strategies of the protest, which often operated as a form of refusal, such as strikes, which always were not only gestures of defense, but also of resistance and agency, both poetic and powerful, where, as Judith Butler writes, vulnerability and agency are thought together. Tuck and Young's understanding of refusal is shaped by Tuck's concept of desire-centered research, which she opposes to the damage-centered research that focuses on pain narratives and positions its subjects as powerless victims. She writes, I quote, Desire-centered research does not deny the experience of tragedy, trauma, and pain, but positions the knowing derived from such experiences as wise, end of quote, acknowledging the complexity of the lived experience. Getting back to the unintentionally revolutionary song by Kino, it is interesting to note that Tuck and Young criticize the theory of change, for it mainly operates through damage-centered logics, where harm must be recorded or proven, and where unprivileged communities must position themselves as powerless to make change. Following the desire-centered framework in the research on the anti-governmental resistance in Belarus is crucial to acknowledge, to acknowledge the agency of the protest movement and to approach the political change critically. After the history of failed protests in contemporary Belarus, many believed that the, state, that the state system would change as soon as a great mass of people gathers on the streets. 
but instead of a triumphant rupture, which a revolutionary event is often imagined as, we arrive to the political moment that now has been lasting for over a year. Massive protest marches instead established a new revolutionary rhythm which interrupted the daily life and finally merged with it for the months to come. A general march on Sundays, a women's march on Saturdays, a march of the retired on Mondays, a march of the people with disabilities on Thursdays, and later, neighborhood marches and various solidarity gestures on any day, along with the multiple decentralized solidarity networks. This was the temporality of every day, the popular protest London that called people together for protesting daily. The march, as a major protest choreography, has been conditioned by its relative safety. Constant mobility within a large crowd reduces the chances of being arrested. But not just a march, a walk as such gradually became one of the basic protest gestures. As Judith Butler writes, quote, sometimes to walk the street poses a challenge to a certain regime, a minor performative disruption enacted by a kind of motion that is at once a movement in the double sense, bodily and political, end of quote. Not limited to the dynamics of continuous movement of the marches, the ongoing political struggle trespasses into daily practices and bodies with their fragility and irregular rhythms. These practices are part of choreo politics, a term introduced by a dance scholar Andrea Lepecki. Choreo politics, he writes, quote, requires a redistribution and reinvention of bodies, effects, and senses through which one may learn how to move politically, how to invent, activate, seek, or experiment with a movement whose only sense, meaning and direction, is the experimental exercise of freedom, end of quote. The political experience of collective movements and gatherings, their inventiveness, commitment, and repetition indeed transformed social relations and led to appearance and self-realization of political subject. Lipeki opposes choreo politics, a movement on the sand, to choreo policing, a movement of conformity, of moving along, circulation that, quote, produce nothing other than a mere spectacle of its own consensual, consensual mobility. Thus, choreo political movement disrupts this continuous circulation of conformity. And it quite literally could be traced through how the most common official choreography of the state parade, the procession, has been transformed into the protest choreography of the march, how routine practices of cues, walking, or stillness became protest gestures, how the labor and educational regimes have been disrupted by strikes. The exhaustion of the continuous movement also questions the temporalities of the revolutionary event. Andrei Lepecki theorizes movement exhaustion in contemporary dance as an ontological critique of a political project of, moder of modernity as being toward movement with its consequent regimes of oppression. I would claim that in relation to political movements and protest choreographies, exhaustion in a double sense, both political and physical, allows us to critically address revolutionary dynamics and temporality with its demand of rapid and abrupt political change. Lipeki suggests rethinking, quote, action and mobility through the performance of still acts rather than continuous movement, end of quote. Still act, a concept suggested by anthropologist Nati Serimitakis, describes a subject's productive and critical interruption of a historical flow. It thus interrupts not only motion, but also the course of historical time, subverting the linear logic and revealing the meaningful lags and pauses. Precisely because the march has an endpoint, the resistance continues alongside public manifestations within self-organized infrastructures in the mundane and intimate gestures. They are part of politics of prefiguration, which subvert hierarchies in political action and the idea of future as its absolute horizon. As Valeria Graziano writes, the specific performativity of prefiguration underscores how social reproduction, networks of care, processes of politicization of collective experiences and imaginations can persist beyond the event that generated them. And I would say that this complicated relationship to time and future characterizes post-socialism in general. Post-socialism could be seen as a failed promise of the future, constantly haunted by its past, socialism. However, I follow the colonial feminist thinkers, Neda Adonasovsky and Kalin Devora, who address post-socialisms in the plural, as a queer time, non-linear, propelled by multiple political desires, imaginaries, and uncertainties, being 
non-unified and associated with multiple places, times and possibilities. So not only a political movement, but also the stuttering, the interruption of linearity of revolutionary time is, paraphrasing Lepecki, quote, a never evolving, evolving commitment, an intersubjective action that moreover must be learned, rehearsed, nurtured, and above all, experimented with, practiced and experienced again and again, and again and again, and in every repetition, through every repetition, renewed, end of quote. Thank you. Thank you, Olya. Our third speaker is Russia Chowdhury. Uh, he didn't uh, send full details, but I think you're still a research associate at McGill University, yeah? Um, do take uh, a minute to correct me and introduce yourself. Uh, uh, you can have an extra minute uh, uh, before your topic, which is the role of religion in the Belarusian protests of 2020. Over to you. Uh, right, thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, greetings everyone from a very windy Ilford here in London, and I hope to see some of you at the, at the reception tonight. Um, I actually am an assistant professor of political science and international relations at Manisa Jalal Bayar University in Manisa in Turkey these days. Um, I used to be uh, indeed a research associate um, uh, at McGill University previously, uh, before taking up my current position a few years ago. Um, so, um, if I may um, just uh, share my slides. Um, Try F5 if it's PowerPoint, although I don't, I'm not sure that's PowerPoint. It's not. We cannot hear you, Rashid. I don't know whether you should try to turn your video off. We could we could still see the PowerPoint without the video, couldn't we? I just stopped the video myself, uh, so let's try now. Right, yeah, just at the, at the moment when I did as well. Uh, is it easier for everyone to hear me now? That's not perfect, but it's much better. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, to go on then. Um, Belarus is, in, in fact, one of the least religious countries in the world. Rashid, I'm, I, it's, it's really difficult to hear you. Can you do anything about your connection? Maybe you can think what to do with it while we are listening to the file. Because it's just impossible to hear. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe you can use your phone or you move closer to the signal. Yeah. Yeah. And there is also some echo. I don't know where it's coming from. Maybe it's somehow fixed. Okay. We we need ten minutes to try and um, improve on that, Rashid. Yeah. Uh, now we can go to Vital. Um, who is research assistant at the History Institute in the University of Greifswald, uh, where North Stream 2 comes to land. Not your fault, but there you go. Um, and is coordinator of the Virtual University of the Baltic Sea region. Uh, his PhD 
very interesting, was on witchcraft in the cultural borderland with trials in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania uh, from the 16th to the 18th century. Um, if I can just get up your um, paper title, it's Enchanted Revolution, the Supernatural and Occult in the Belarusian Crisis of 2020-21. Bitter. Thank you. Uh, indeed, I am a historian of early modern time, uh, but uh, the events of in Belarus in recent times inspired me to uh, explore magic and uh, witchcraft uh, and uh, different uh, supernatural things in my native country, in my native time. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, I would like to talk. Uh, I would like to, uh, to talk about uh, the supernatural, uh, mystics, and occult in the Belarusian crisis or Belarusian revolution of uh, the recent two years. Uh, generally, uh, the relation to supernatural in our time uh, usually characterized by the term coined by Max Weber in the early 20th century. The centurious German scholar proposed the idea of uh, disenchantment of the world. Uh, so, uh, according to him, and uh, now it's a kind of mainstream idea in uh, uh, academy and both in public opinion, that uh, uh, the relation to supernatural changed in the way of rationalization, and uh, people stopped believing in hidden mystic. Uh, powers that influence their lives, but uh, explain or rely on those uh, forces that could be uh, studied, uh, measured, and uh, somehow that are natural, part of natural world. However, the practice um, uh, demonstrated since the times of Max Weber that uh, um, this uh, rational world is still uh, pretty far from uh, ideal as uh, Max Weber considered, and uh, there are even some tendencies called re-enchantment, re-enchantment, like the return to this uh, enchanted vision of the world. And especially it is common for the times of uh, crisis when even highly modernized, urbanized societies at some point uh, turn to mystics or supernatural in different ways. Um, and, um, uh, uh, this uh, usually hidden part of uh, discourses of culture became less, uh, became more evident. So, uh, Belarus uh, in recent two years uh, faced uh, probably the most acute crisis uh, in its independent history, and I think one of the most acute in the 20th century at all. And uh, no wonder that. Uh, uh, people, different social groups, people of different political views began to uh, be more prone to uh, supernatural elements of their worldview. However, uh, this uh, approach to supernatural may vary from uh, totally symbolic vision uh, up to 100% uh, uh, belief in the reality of supernatural and uh, the whole continuum between these two poles. So, uh, for example, uh, if we turn to the Russian society, especially to those uh, proponents of changes, uh, we can see a great uh, anxiety towards different uh, predictions towards the future. It's pretty, it seems natural as far as in 2020, the um, routine way of life, or this is predictable stability, uh, beloved or hated was crushed, and uh, the hope for the fast uh, revolution, fast changes was um, challenged by fast return of counter-revolution, of repressions, and uh, people, especially those engaged in protests, uh, were uh, really lost their feel of safety for their economic well-being, even for their physical well-being. And in such situation, it is pretty natural to seek for some confirmation of uh, that uh, helps uh, to foresee future that everything will be okay. Uh, not everyone uh, that usually 
not, not every of these people normally believe in some supernatural things, in, uh, engaged in uh, divinations. But uh, if you, and if you ask them, say, oh no, I just do it uh, for fun or just to see it. Nevertheless, uh, different uh, signs, different uh, uh, divinations, different prophecies attracted the huge attention of medias. It became a uh, virus content in social networks. Uh, is the very presidential campaign of 2020 started with uh, some sign uh, like from old chronicles, this uh, falcon uh, throw a dead mouse just in front of uh, journalists who were waiting outside the central electoral committee, uh, waiting for registered presidential candidates. Uh, there were many other signs and usually Journalists take it and spread it like uh, something symbolic and funny, but uh, we, can, we can see that uh, uh, these signs look uh, exactly like those written in Chronicles. As a historian, if I see this falcon or this halo during the funeral of Roman Benarenko in the old Chronicle, I, will, I would be uh, sure that, oh, it's just a literary moment to express the idea of author. However, the way of framing these uh, symbolic events is really in this murky area between belief in supernatural and the symbolic manifestation of some hopes and aspirations. Mm. Uh, an interesting thing was uh, and is still a huge attention to different uh, divinations. Uh, and uh, the internet is full of different divinations about uh, Belarusian future, done in different techniques. You can see online uh, predictions made by te technologies of astrology, uh, tarot cards or playing cards, even um, uh, divinations with uh, coffee grounds, runic div divinations, some uh, extra senses, psychics begin to uh, make their predictions about uh, uh, recent events uh, with methods of uh, automatic writing or channeling with some mediumship with uh, uh, some mysterious teachers. Of course, the most popular are astrology and tarot cards. Uh, some of uh, uh, channels devoted to, this top, to these divinations uh, attract a really huge amount of uh, uh, views, like uh, hundreds of thousands of views and uh, thousands of comments from Belarusians, uh, like uh, commenting, uh, thank you for bringing us hope, thank you for confirmation of our good future. Um, what is uh, significant here to mention that um, all these uh, infrastructure of uh, diviners did not exist during these events. Usually it was an existing part within the Russian internet, Runet. Uh, mostly uh, these diviners are not Belarusians, but Ukrainians, Russians, they react um, swiftly to any political changes and make their predictions for any political changes. But at some moment, many of them turned to Belarusian audience and stayed on this topic, despite uh, the Russian topic was a bit out of, uh, of uh, media focus. And uh, the Another thing is that uh, almost all these uh, prognoses are negative for Belarusian regime and uh, mostly friendly and positive for protest movement. Only one uh, channeling medium was pretty negative to uh, opposition, Belarusian position like dark forces from the West. Nevertheless, uh, it still predicted a bad future for Belarusian regime. It might stay in a kind of uh, internet subculture, but uh, many the Russian uh, widely read uh, independent media began to uh, pay attention to these predictions and began to publish their prognosis, sometimes in semi-serious way, sometimes it's in pretty serious way, like Charte uh, Dionstasium is really fond of um, posting predictions about it. So it uh, became a phenomenon of Belarusian public discussions and uh, media life. Uh, and what is pretty interesting to see that no attempts to use such uh, astrologists or 
as a uh, diviners for state propaganda. All state medias traditionally apply to astrologists, especially in New Year time, but they usually make their predictions about uh, private things, about uh, general situation in the world, but I couldn't find any predictions about success of Lukashenko or, uh, or of his regime. Another thing is prophecies. Uh, this um, pretty even more mystique thing uh, also had uh, some search in Belarus. It's not a new one. In 2003, it was also a prophecy of a uh, Protestant pastor from America about the uh, swift uh, change of regime. However, it was uh, mostly forgotten. And uh, in um, autumn 2020, another prediction uh, appeared. Uh, uh, American revivalist pastor Jeff J uh, Jensen in his uh, preaching in Riga a year before, he told a lot of different things, but also he uh, told that in 2020 Belarus will be liberated, it will be a couple of uh, husband and wife, and even uh, during his uh, speech about Belarus, the name Svetlana was mentioned. So this uh, compilation was a huge, uh, of huge effect in the Russian internet, and uh, it was a uh, like um, a virus content that brought uh, for a moment uh, this um, confidence in the future. Uh, or there were some um, folklore narratives about a mysterious person met, uh, hitchhiked on the road and uh, the, some friend of friend give him a lift and this uh, old man made uh, some predictions, some prophecies, two of them already fulfilled. And the last one about uh, the left uh, leaving Lukashenko is still going. This uh, narration is pretty uh, uh, old, almost uh, since like old minute, it's out. Yeah, it's coming back, uh, but pretend. Another thing is uh, uh, religious symbolics. Of course, religion is a kind of supernatural in itself. However, there are some uh, pretty uh, peculiar practices used from the side of uh, government supporters. For example, the notorious Gubo Peak police unit. Uh, it's uh, had uh, Nikolai Kartenko used to say that they are warriors of Christ, that uh, their uh, policemen are of righteousness, and uh, uh, that's why God protects them. And uh, speaking about um, uh, Lukashenko himself, uh, we can see his uh, change from orthodox atheist to some more devoted to religious practices. However, we can't see any exact involvement in occult activities. However, uh, different rumors used to all the time attribute him to uh, occult uh, activities. Even this uh, cologne on his neck from this video was attributed as uh, goddess Ishtar. However, I can't say it's really so. So uh, his image is also in public opinion, in public discourse, is covered with supernatural. Okay, so uh, to conclude and to uh, uh, make some conclusions, so the supernatural discourse in Belarus is not uh, and, uh, the thing that originated during these protests, but um, uh, it is uh, rather a um, source of powerful symbols and images for propaganda, for public debates, for especially for emotional expression of political views. Um, and these uh, range of tendencies to so the Russian society in crisis, uh, rather a highlight of the aspirations and fears of particular groups than uh, um, a tool to uh, achieve some goals. And uh, so, so we can say that supporters of the regime employ religious means to state their rightness uh, and to protect them from the perceived evil of the enemies and especially to protect order. So all this uh, supernatural is about protecting order and proponent of changes try to foresee the future, to seek, uh, to find a relief and to confirm their uh, hopes and their aspirations. Uh, so we can say that in the Russian case, uh, this crisis did not radically change the position of supernatural. Uh, it uh, rather intensified this existing phenomenon and uh, attracted public attention to them, then uh, created something new, but nevertheless, these uh, highlights are uh, very remarkable and bring a lot of material 
for scholars of magic and supernatural. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vital. Um, shall we try Rashi again? Yes, if you could close that down, Vital. Rashid, are you still with us? Uh, right, thank you. Yeah, yes, I am. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I hope that um, you can hear me better now and hopefully without an echo. Much better. Uh, and uh, that's wonderful. And I'm also much closer to the router. So hopefully I'll be able to keep my camera on. If not, I will, uh, I will certainly turn it off. Um, so for now, I will just uh, share my screen uh, with you uh, once more. Uh, Great. Uh, let me um, continue um, uh, the volume of the previous uh, presentation. Um, I will be now talking about uh, sort of uh, traditional uh, religion, if you will. Um, and it is perhaps a curious choice of topic on my part, uh, given that uh, a Gallup survey a while ago now, uh, but I, as far as I know, no such worldwide survey has been repeated. Um, classified Belarus as one of the 10 least religious countries uh, in the world. Uh, nevertheless, uh, various um, quite uh, significant religious figures uh, within Belarus did have quite a lot to say uh, about um, the, um, the way that uh, the aftermath of the election of 2020 was handled uh, by the Belarusian authorities. Um, and, 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 and some actually joined in uh, the protest movement um, quite uh, directly. But as you can see in the, in the data that I have uh, up on the screen, um, the UK and where we are right now, or some of us and Belarus are actually quite similar um, in their lack of religiosity uh, and, and, and Belarus and Russia um, uh, even more so. It's is entirely irreligious. Uh, what Gallup meant by religiosity is um, simply respondents answer to the question, is religion an important part of your life? Um, and as you can see, 34% said yes in Belarus. Uh, but the number of people who ascribe um, religious sentiments to themselves or uh, the number of people who, uh, who believe in God or the number of, number of people who belong to a particular religion is much higher. Uh, but that is uh, a rather new phenomenon of the Russian Revolution. Um, you know, religion uh, was sort of the normal, being religious was the normal state of affairs, um, with very few exceptions. Um, however, uh, by the, you know, towards the end of Soviet rule, the opposite was rather the case. Um, but with the, uh, with the end of, um, of the Soviet regime, as you can see on the screen, there has been a steady uptick, a steady and continuous uptick uh, in the percentage of Belarusians uh, who are theists, who describe themselves as uh, believing in God. But what is curious is that the number of people who belong to one or other religion is actually higher than the number of people who, be who believe in God. In other words, there is an people who belong to religions and atheists, and this overlap, of course, is uh, to some extent uh, personified uh, in the person of Alexander Lukashenko himself, who famously uh, described himself uh, at the beginning, you know, towards the beginning of his presidency as an Orthodox Christian atheist. Um, and uh, you know, every once in a while he uses religious language. You know, he appeals to um, Gospod, as he says in Russian, the Lord, in other words. Um, and, and, and yet, um, you know, um, uh, has never clearly uh, indicated a change of heart when it comes to actual belief uh, in God. Um, now, when it comes to um, when it comes to the religious makeup uh, of the population of Belarus, um, you know th there have been numerous attempts to quantify it and say, unlike unlike Britain, um, the Belarusian government does not actually ask people about their religious affiliation in censuses, which means that the best uh, way that the government has or that uh, independent organizations have uh, to try to gauge uh, you know the percentage of Belarusians who belong to this or that religion um, is through is through surveys um, and so the 
really the, the best sort of uh, guesses that we have, uh, because they are that, um, is that Orthodox Christians make up, as you can see, about 83% um, of the Belarusian public, uh, and then Catholics uh, a lot less, but nevertheless, they are uh, the biggest and most significant uh, religious minority. Um, and this has been the state of affairs, of course, for centuries. Uh, so they are perhaps 10% or just under that. Um, and then um, other Protestant, uh, sorry, other uh, Christians would largely mean Protestant. Uh, and uh, finally, a very small percentage uh, of the Belarusian population are Muslims and Jew Jews by religion, um, as well as increasingly Buddhists, actually. Um, but in any case, um, the you know the bulk of the rest of my present focus on the two largest Christian denomination um, who together uh, make up or 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 you know uh, who together uh, claim the loyalty of about ninety percent of the of the public. Um, this is Tadeusz Kondrusiewicz, um, who or or in Belarusian Tadeusz Kondrusiewicz, uh, who um, was until recently the Archbishop of Minsk and Mohilov. Um, in Belarus, uh, so the Archbishop of the largest diocese and also the Metropolitan of the Catholic Church in Belarus. Um, and uh, he famously, after uh, the um, sort of the, the launch of the uh, repressive uh, mechanisms uh, against, um, against the protesters uh, in, in August 2020, um, immediately condemned the police violence that was going on, uh, prayed in front of a prison on, on Valadarska Street, um, where uh, many of the protesters were um, He also held an ecumenical prayer for peace in Belarus, peace meaning essentially an end to police violence, because the protests, of course, were peaceful. He gave a message to the Belarusian public from the European Conference of Catholic Commissions on Justice and Peace. And, and this message said that the Belarusian government ought to free all prison, political prisoners, obviously. And, and, and also there was a condemnation of violence from, uh, from um, this organization as well that he, that he relayed. He called on all Belarusians to say an Our Father um, for the sake of the country. And at the ecumenical prayer service, which he organized together with representatives of the Orthodox Church, of uh, the full gospel uh, Protestant church, of um, a Muslim organization and a Jewish organization uh, in the church of Saints uh, Simon and Helen in Minsk. Uh, he said that the basis, uh, the basis um, for this shared um, uh, sort of, um, uh, this shared concern for what was going on in Belarus and, and uh, this shared uh, in the prayer service uh, was not say, uh, to be found in a common humanity or in the common belief in God. Rather, it was to be found in the fact that all of the, all of the religious uh, figures present uh, had the same passport uh, and belonged to the same country and therefore ought to be part of the same family. Now, this concept was, of course, significant because he indeed had his literal passport uh, blocked soon after he went on a short trip to Poland or what was supposed to be a short trip to Poland on the way back. Um, his passport was declared invalid, um, and Lukashenko himself uh, then came out and said that uh, the trip by Kondrushevich to Poland had been intended uh, to receive sort of instructions on how to destabilize the situation in Belarus further, um, and that Kondrushevich was basically an agent of influence. Uh, now, of course, he uh, is a Belarusian citizen and does not hold any other citizenship, and according to the Belarusian constitution, um, even the one that Lukashenko sort of forced through in 1996, um, a Belarusian citizen cannot be prevented from entering Belarusian territory. And yet this was uh, done to Kondrushevich. Eventually, Pope Francis uh, intervened personally uh, by sending the uh, Vatican uh, nuncio uh, in the UK, actually, who had previously been the Vatican nuncio um, in Belarus, a man named uh, Archbishop Claudio Gujarotti, uh, he sent him on a, on a personal visit um, uh, to meet Lukashenko, uh, where, where, where Gujarati delivered a two-page uh, personal letter from Pope Francis. And uh, on, uh, on, then on Christmas Eve, Catholic Christmas Eve of, of 2020, Lukashenko said that out of his great respect for Pope Francis, and knowing that Pope Francis is you know, our man, although he does not sort of stand up for Belarus 
in other words, stand up for Lukashenko in international affairs. Nevertheless, he's a figure to be respected and therefore his respect, sorry, rather um, his request should be granted and therefore Kondrushevich uh, should be allowed back in. But of course, Kondrushevich's position as the most important archbishop in Belarus was um, shaky from that point on and he soon uh, retired uh, after reaching the age of 75 um, and afterwards um, was uh, replaced uh, a year later uh, with Yusuf Stanievsky, uh, who um, uh, we should say um, was the deputy uh, archbishop, uh, sorry, the deputy bishop of Hrodna and um, had been one of two signatories of a letter from the Catholic leadership of Rodna asking the Belarusian government to allow Kondrushevich in. When Kondrushevich was allowed in, Stanevsky went and picked him up from the now infamous uh, Kuznitsa uh, um, crossing. Um, and yet, uh, what uh, the Belarusian opposition noted was that unlike Kondrushevich, um, who had a very important amount of influence both at home and abroad, uh, Stanievsky had been uh, one of the prelates of the Catholic Church in Belarus who had not actively condemned the police violence against protesters, um, nor is he internationally known at all, partially given the fact that he knows no foreign languages, he only speaks Belarusian, Russian uh, and Polish. Um, um, so, so since the appointment of Stanievsky, the Catholic Church has become sort of quieter when it comes to its condemnation of the regime. And a very similar dynamic has played out in the largest Christian denomination in Belarus, and namely the um, Belarusian exarchate of the Russian Orthodox uh, Church, to which, as, as you can see, more than 80% of Belarusians um, claim to belong. Um, uh, Metropolitan Pavel uh, was the uh, was the Archbishop uh, of, of, of Minsk, uh, the Orthodox Archbishop of Minsk at the time the protest broke out. Now he actually is a Russian citizen. He never took up uh, Belarusian citizenship. He never learned the Belarusian language and so on. Um, nevertheless, he was known as somebody who actually promoted the use of Belarusian as a liturgical language um, in the Orthodox Church, just as Shevich uh, did in, in, in the Catholic Church. Um, and um, as soon as Lukashenko claimed to have won the election, uh, Two minutes left, Pavel Rishi. congratulated him, but four days later- Two minutes left, Rishi. I'm sorry? Two minutes yeah. left. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, four days later, he retracted his congratulations to Lukashenko and um, he actually apologized for having congratulated him. He visited uh, one of the victims of, of police violence in a hospital um, and uh, at that point, the uh, leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow pulled the plug on him, transferred him to Russia, and um, a man who was much more amenable to the regime was brought in, is a local Belarusian uh, church prelate, uh, and he was appointed as metropolitan. So now uh, the Orthodox community is metropolitan, Vinyamin, um, who is... Um, rather more friendly towards Lukashenko. And um, he said when he was appointed, you know, if churchmen get involved in politics, who is going to teach the people the divine law? So he made this division between religion and politics very clear. And after that, Lukashenko actually jokingly said at the meeting with Vinyamin uh, in front of the media that once he retires uh, from the presidency, he would like to become Vinyamin's um, assistant. Um, so um, just to, I mean, uh, Archbishop Artemi actually was another, um, was actually the Orthodox uh, Bishop of Rodna was removed uh, from his post for saying that there are two Batskas, which is of course the pun very significant for Belarus, two fathers. One is the father of truth, which is God. The other is the father of lies, which is the devil. Um, and you have to choose between these two Batskas. So he's removed uh, from his position for saying that. Uh, here we find, um, um, Protestants, uh, Protestant Jewish and Muslim religious leaders joining in this ecumenical prayer service organized uh, earlier by Kondrushevich. And just to finish up, um, Marx obviously famously called religion the opiate of the people. In the Belarusian context, we see that uh, religion was a vehicle for protest. Here we see Kondrushevich praying in front of uh, a prison where um, uh, opponents of the regime were being held. Um, it can be a source of uh, comfort for those who want to protest uh, from a um, kind of religious or spiritual uh, standpoint. And certainly uh, religion can and is uh, being used as an ally uh, of the state um, as well. Thank you.
Thanks, Rashid. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have half an hour for questions. Uh, I have one. There's one currently in the chat from Ilya. I'll read that in a minute. Um, ask your questions in one of two ways, either by typing in the chat uh, or by raising your virtual hand. Uh, so our first question, uh, we have two questions. Uh, I'm sure you, everybody can see these, but I'll read them out anyway. Uh, Ilya to Vital, what cultural codes do the authorities and the opposition appeal to? Christianity, paganism, new age, or something else? And then from Ilya to Vital and Rashid, can we say that a civil religion is being created in Belarus? Um, is the regime trying to sacralize itself? So two questions for Vital, one for Rashid there. Uh, second question I'll read out to Olya. I'm interested in the role of the individual or protest choreography. How can this tension between the collective bodies, movements and motions of the body within the protest dance be emphasized? And my second question is about the process of translation as a physical gesture into a symbol as happened with a gesture gesture by DJs uh, for Perriamen. How do you conceptualize this transformation process in terms of the poetics of movement? Um, uh, yes, Yarek says we'll ask him um, uh, the next set of questions to read their own questions out. Uh, we have three more questions in, but uh, maybe we'll deal with those first. Ilya for Vital and Rashid. So, uh, as for if consider what is the conscious of politics of these uh, sides, um, I can definitely say that um, uh, the camp uh, of Lukashenko supporters uh, pretty consciously try to use uh, uh, orthodox uh, discourse. Uh, uh, for example, the notorious um, Grigory Azarionik apply very often the term biasy, like demons, but from church Slavonic discourse to demonstrate on the one side, uh, rightness of defenders of the order, on the other side, uh, those protesters as these uh, chaotic, anarchic, uh, but pretty weak uh, uh, supernatural power. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are numerous attempts to use this discourse despite uh, officially Orthodox Church, uh, uh, even under Vinyamin, tried to underline its um, uh, neutrality. Nevertheless, this Orthodox discourse uh, that linked uh, regime to Russia, to these Russian uh, roots, uh, and uh, uh, tried to use anti-revolutionary Russian discourse, uh, it helps. As for the opponents, there is no any uh, more or less conscious way of uh, applying these supernatural elements. I can say it is no uh, Christian, neither pagan or new age way, but rather a pop culture way. So there are uh, this tendency to pick uh, some uh, elements um, of uh, like Hollywood-like, like, like uh, prophecy from here, from this Protestant pa um, pastor. And uh, for example, these uh, uh, divinations from some exotic uh, diviner. So I mean those uh, things that uh, appear in non, not uh, subcultural, but uh, like general media discourse or the lexics used by bloggers and commentators like uh, goblins for uh, right police and so on. Uh, this um, uh, mix, uh, this fusion is rather of pop cultural uh, nature. However, there are still some folklore elements like this uh, uh, mystic uh, old hitchhiker or like uh, Upir, uh, that this uh, nickname for Lukashenko, like this old undead that uh, still try to get uh, all everything to his uh, past. It's a pretty, uh, pretty symbolic, but still it came from folklore. However, rather from pop culture. So I think uh, attempts of uh, quasi-orthodox discourse versus uh, pop culture, we can describe the situation. And uh, um, about civil religion, I don't think so. Uh, there, are, there were no um, any attempts before this to maintain some religious things. There are some 
elements uh, of uh, uh, like uh, of attempt, some attempts to to bring some uh, supernatural or even divine elements for Lukashenko, for example. Like we need to uh, uh, like this uh, uh, in uh, several propaganda narratives. But uh, I can say that this cult as something. Uh, as a directed politics uh, exist. So no, my answer for uh, civil religion is rather no, then you can see something. Yeah, okay, thank you, Vital. Um, so Ilya, did you want to come back? No, same question to you, Rashi. Right, thanks. Yeah, so if, if I may just answer the the, um, uh, the question in, in, in Vital's footsteps, then um, I may actually disagree with him um, in that I think that um, Vukasenka has um, sort of throughout the years appealed to a form of civil religion of the kind that, that Bella actually proposed the existence of in that, you know, there's... Um, um, that, that God is, you know, continuously blessing America and 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 supporting the enterprise of the Americans and and so on. Um, this is the way in which Lukashenko tends to appeal to God as well, even if he's a God that Lukashenko has said he doesn't believe in. Um, for example, at the outset of the coronavirus pandemic, when Lukashenko, you know, had been saying again and again that uh, the more important danger. Uh, when it came to the coronavirus was um, was the psychosis of fear that it was causing rather than the disease itself. At that point, in one of the in one of the speeches he gave on this topic, uh, he said, you know, that we suffered enough in the Second World War, and so the Lord ought to spare us this time. Um, so again, it was this sort of generalized appeal to the Lord, as in, of course, uh, to God, who. Um, is always uh, sort of because of the uh, redemptive suffering that the Belarusian nation has undergone, the Lord is always a priori on the side of the Belarusians and therefore, you know, the Belarusians as Lukashenko understands them, of course, and therefore, um, you know, while he may be uh, sort of plaguing various other nations, you know, with this, with, with this disease, when it comes to Belarus, he will, um, not cause too much damage uh, through it. Well, you know, to me, this is, of course, a form of a form of civil religion. Um, but uh, when it comes to the regime sacralizing itself, just to very briefly um, refer to the second part of the question, I don't think Lukashenko has enough of an ideology uh, in order to uh, create a whole kind of vehicle of sacralization, you know, the way that, uh, you know, the Soviet regime uh, did or the way that various fascist regimes did, uh, you know, with enormous marches and enormous flags and um, uh, with, with their own sort of uh, semi-divine figures like Lenin with their statues and so on. Uh, Lukashenko simply does not have the equivalent of that. What he has is, say, a, a postage stamp that I have that refers to him as the first president of the Republic of Belarus. Well, that that does not match the level of the hundreds of statues of Lenin that you would see in, everywhere. So um, his civic religion is rather a kind of foxy kind, I would say, but it nevertheless does exist in my view. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Andrew, we don't hear you. Your microphone is off. Whoops, normally get that right, sorry about that. I see several virtual hands up, we'll get to you shortly, but first, um, Tanya's question to Ollie. Mm -hmm. um, I should not read it right, because everyone, I guess, see it. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya, uh, for your questions. Uh, for the first part, uh, I would mention that I'm, uh, nice to see you. I'm more interested in uh, collective choreographies, uh, but also, uh, I would also emphasize that in those uh, collective choreographies and also within those shared gestures, which uh, uh, many of us, I'm sure, like know, there are these very few few gestures which also became symbols of the, for example, unite unite team of alternative candidates, like the V symbol, the feast, and many others. Uh, so within those shared gestures. Uh, I think it's important to stress that they often become very ambiguous uh, and often very personal. 
uh, and uh, for example, um, when I uh, interviewed um, participants of the protests, uh, particularly about uh, the most common protest gestures for them, uh, I uh, found out uh, that very often they had their particular meanings uh, for those uh, gestures that were very personal and not at all this like common interpretations. Uh, and also uh, very often they picked up the gestures uh, which were not at all uh, those which we normally see in the media or in the protest, but it was something very personal and intimate for them. And often uh, there were like certain stories behind them, why they do it, how they do it. So I think uh, it is uh, important to stress uh, that behind this, uh, within these protest gestures, uh, their power often lies not, not just, or maybe not even to the more to the bigger extent in this uh, shared meaning, but precisely in this ambiguity uh, and uh, complexity, and sometimes even uh, this instability and indiscernibility. Uh, and often, I think of also we all know that often the meaning of uh, certain gestures change in the context. For example, uh, the victory symbol, which was. Um, like a shared gesture for the morning uh, ceremonies, like to mourn, for example, the death of Roman Bandarenka during the minute of silence. And in this context, uh, it is not, um, it is hard to claim that this gesture is the gesture of victory, which is like the kind of international meaning, but it's rather, I don't know, the gesture of mourning or of unity. So yeah, I would stress these ambiguities uh, within this uh, collective movement. And the second uh, question, I would say that uh, I, I uh, approach these protest gestures already in this double uh, sense as a symbolic gesture and as a physical uh, motion. So for me, there is not really any uh, transformation because I think that they already always exist in these uh, two re registers. Yes, I hope I answered. Yeah, thank you, Olya. Thank you. Thank you, Olya. Um, we have um, two yellow hands up, uh, so Sandor and Yulia, would you like to ask your questions? And then I'll ask Batleshchik to read out his question or her. Sandor. Yulia, Yulia was the first. Thank you. Yulia first. Thank you so much. I have a question for Dr. Alena Nikolayenka, but first of all, thank you all for your fascinating talks. I wanted to ask uh, about the trope of father of the nation that Lukashenko obviously enjoys to believe in, um, now disappointed by ungrateful children or whatever. I was just curious about um, how would you characterize another famous trope, uh, another famous saying of Lukashenko about the country when he said, you do not give your loved one away or something like that, uh, in Russian. Um, I find it interesting because a loved one here, Belarus is meant by the loved one and loved one is clearly gendered. And it seems like Lukashenko here uh, tries to take on also a role of a protective, courageous husband who will protect his female partner from the outer forces threatening her, uh, which also might connect to the rhetorics of World War II that are often used by Lukashenko. And uh, I find it fascinating as far as I'm aware as a Belarusian that this saying played against in a way um, against Lukashenko because members of protest movement were capable of seeing another dimension in that space of him being not a loving spouse but a controlling abusive uh, a husband who, ha who gives no space for the agency of the loved one. So the question is, would you say that what, what is happening here? Is he combining the role of a husband and a father, and going back to your argument of both Lukashenko and Tikhanovska acting according to gender stereotypes, would it nonetheless be fair to say that Tikhanovska speaks from a more complex position of empowered female leader, uh, a real mother and a wife, not a metaphorical mother and a partner of a nation, which kind of makes her position more strained away from this gender stereotypical binary thinking. But I was very happy to hear your talk and thank you very much again. Thank you, Yulia. Um, Sandor. Yes. Uh, uh, my question concerns the Belarusian church, uh, the situation of Belarusian churches. And uh, can you imagine 
uh, that uh, 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 according to Latvia Lutheran churches, there are two uh, uh, divided Lutheran churches in Latvia because they uh, uh, have divided around a particular question. That was the question of, uh, of election of uh, women for priests, but it's not important. There is a, a great uh, a question of great significance and the church uh, divided into two churches. Another example is very clear for, for uh, all of us. The Ukrainian churches were divided uh, due to uh, political questions. So can you imagine that in such a situation when the society is divided, uh, 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 the Belarusian, Belarusian Orthodox Church uh, can be divided not according to the uh, highest leaders, but uh, absolutely, absolutely on the basic level to on the level of believer too. Or the Belarusian society is, is not, not able for such processes uh, as, as in Ukraine or, or, or in Latvia. That's a question for Rashid, I presume. Yes, yes, yes. But Leischik would like to add a similar question. Right, because those two are very closely related, certainly. That's, that's right, yeah. Yes, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, um, is the Orthodox Church collaboration with the regime causing it damage in the eyes of the Belarusian Orthodox believers? Um, Rashi. Right, thanks. Um, so the answer um, really depends on, uh, well, beginning with but uh, uh, questions. The question first, uh, the answer depends on whether you are looking at the Orthodox Church as a structure with, with its hierarchy and therefore you judge it on the actions of Vinyamin, etc., or whether you look at the church as a collective of believers. And the answer re is, is really quite different um, based on that. Now, of course, some people, um, some uh, Orthodox Christians in Belarus are just so disappointed by what Batlistrik um, calls the collaboration uh, of the Orthodox Church with the regime, uh, that they have actually left the Orthodox Church. And um, in these situations, we have uh, sort of uh, anecdotal evidence that people have been converting to the Catholic Church, largely because they were quite impressed by the stance that uh, Kandrusevich took um, at the beginning of the, of the crisis. And of course, Kandrusevich uh, was able to sort of maintain the stance longer sort of until the end of uh, August uh, until you know he was forced to do into exile for four months um, uh, and and the Orthodox Church got rid of uh, Pavel sort of uh, more quickly than that at the same time uh, there is not 